the book of Revelation and we resume our study in Revelation chapter 17 verse 1 today Revelation 17 verse 1 Lord we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth your word is truth in Jesus name Amen one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me come I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters in scripture the true church which is made up of all genuine Christians is referred to as the bride of Christ and so if the true church is the bride of Christ then the prostitute here represents false religion false Christianity false religion in general false religion regardless of its form is going to come to an end in the final days of this world and that's what these verses are talking about verse 2 speaking of this false religion with her the kings of the earth committed adultery and that would be spiritual adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries false religion is a spiritual counterfeit it looks good on the outside but since its teachings conflict with the Word of God it does spiritual harm not spiritual good in fact any religious teaching that is contrary to scripture will lead its followers away from God no matter how pretty it may look outwardly verse 3 then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns well you can decorate false teaching unbiblical teaching and false religion with all sorts of pomp and ceremony and religious veneer but as we see in verse 3 it is still moral and spiritual rot to God it is still blasphemous for the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold precious stones and pearls she held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries notice very wealthy outwardly successful too lots of followers and of course every one of them filthy in the eyes of God and every one of them on the road to hell you see when a religion is wrong because its teachings contradict the Bible it's going to produce spiritual corruption and eternal damnation no matter how good it may look on the surface and Jesus hit the nail on the head when he called religions like that whitewashed tombs pious on the outside ornate on the outside but inside full of spiritual rot and corruption and many people are swayed by a fancy religious appearance and they don't consider whether it's what it is what's taught is in line with God's Word or not and that's the real issue verse 5 the title was written on her forehead mystery Babylon the great the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth so we see great in the eyes of the masses but an abomination to God which leads me to say this beware the crowds when referring to his people Jesus always called them his little flock Jesus also said narrow is the way which leads to life and few there be who find it verse 6 I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the Saints the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus and when I saw her I was greatly astonished then the angel said to me why are you astonished I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides which has the seven heads and the ten horns notice what it says she was drunk with the blood of the Saints 
Throughout the centuries, true Bible-believing Christians have been murdered in cold blood because they lived for Jesus and spoke the Word of God. And they've also been persecuted for not towing the line of the unbiblical religiosity of corrupt, corrupt men who claim to represent God but do not. And the religionists who do not know Christ are called harlots by God. They are an abomination to God. The Bible teaches that any religion that talks about or venerates anyone or anything as much or more than the Lord Jesus Christ is a spiritual harlot and it is represented in this end time religion in these verses. And God will destroy it before Jesus returns. 8. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose oops, I gotta change my turn my page, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. Notice, the unsaved are astonished. The unsaved marvel at this false religious system. It's on its way to perdition, says the Lord, but they just think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. God's about to destroy it, and they think it's the greatest religion ever. False, ornate religion that appeals to the five senses can easily easily lead people astray. That's why. Do not judge religion by your senses. Judge it by the Word of God. Judge it by Scripture. If it doesn't follow the Bible, it's wrong, and it's going to eventually be destroyed. Verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. And Rome is known as the city of seven hills. So this false religion that leads so many astray in the final days of the world will be headquartered in Rome. 10. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is the eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings, along with the beast. They have one purpose, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. In other words, this end time system will be an unholy unity between a false religion and a political state, and it's going to be powerful because that political state is going to be the one world government of the final days. And it's going to be joined to the false religious system. And it's powerful and scary because if you don't renounce Christ and do religion their way, they'll kill you. At least try. And in many cases, succeed. So this religion, headquartered in Rome, is a political, civil, and religious entity. Verse 14. They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Notice. With Jesus will be his chosen, called, and faithful followers. That's talking about Christians. True Christians. And notice how true Christians are called the faithful. That means Jesus is the most important thing to them. And you can tell it by talking to them and by observing them. They are faithful to Jesus and they're faithful to the Bible. But they are not faithful to a pretty and popular religion that teaches things which are contrary to the Bible. Verse 15, Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Again, popularity means nothing. This false religion of the end times has many members 
from all over the world, but it's leading them all astray. God says it's a prostitute. God's going to destroy it. Popularity means nothing. 16. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Boy, notice the 180 that the world government does here in the final days. What we see here in verse 16 is double cross and treachery. The false religion of the end days. Like all false religions, they double cross Jesus with their false teachings that appeal to the crowds. Rather than appealing to Jesus, they appeal to the crowds because good numbers mean more money, you know. But eventually, her unsaved members turn against her. That's what she gets. Listen, when a church's teachings are designed to appeal to a large number of unsaved people, they are just cultivating trouble for themselves. A church that doesn't demand repentance and a sincere commitment to Christ and to the Word of God from its members will serve as a religious harbor for the unsaved. It'll be a, it'll be a harbor for the spiritually dead who tolerate and promote unrighteousness, and that's going to backfire. 17. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beasts their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Notice, God has put it into their hearts. Notice, to accomplish his purpose. God uses the actions of evil people and evil systems to bring about his own sovereign purposes. God doesn't applaud evil. He doesn't force anyone to do evil. But he is big enough and smart enough to use their bad to bring about good. What I'm saying is God is never outsmarted by anyone who does evil, and he's never outmaneuvered either. Chapter 18, after this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had, a great, he had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. In other words, what we see here is that the party is over for sinners in the final days. The world system is destroyed, and that's what they lived for. The system, made up of people from all over the world who excluded God from their life, is seen crashing in the final days. Oh, you know, the ungodly world and its system gave its people wealth and entertainment and immorality and a false religion even, but as we see here, it all comes crashing down in the final days. The world keeps people occupied and keeps their mind off God and off Jesus and off heaven and off hell and some, to some degree off of death. But in the end, that same world system brings eternal misery and hell for those who won't repent. 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. God is saying, if you're my child in Christ Jesus, then do not live like the unsaved lived. For starters, God deserves better behavior than that from the people who he has saved from hell. But secondly, it's not at all smart. Because if we live like the world, we're going to suffer the consequences of sin like the world. God is saying, do not compromise with sin if you're a Christian. Verse 6. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen 
I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. The pleasure the unsaved derive by their sin will be replaced by double the amount of punishment, torment, and sorrow. See, God is trying to tell people that the price of sin is too high to make it worth doing. It's a bad deal, you see. Very bad deal. Verse 8. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Wealthy sinners can avoid some forms of trouble. Their wealth can keep them out of some forms of trouble. But eventually their wealth and their power fails. And when that happens, their world comes crashing down quickly. Notice what it says here in verse 8. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. It's going to happen fast. And it does happen fast. The end comes quickly for most unsaved people. And it certainly will in the final days. But it does today too. Most people who die today never expected to die. Not today anyway. anyway. When they got up this morning, do you think that they thought this was going to be their final day on earth? No. Most of them didn't realize that they would be standing before the divine judge before this day is over. Most of the people who entered into eternal hell today never dreamed that it would happen. 9. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and they will mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power, in one hour your doom has come. And we see from this that the friends of the world never thought this day would come. They stand at a distance and they are horrified by what they see. They never thought it would come. They never thought their life like, and their, their lifestyle would end. See, their lust for sin had dulled their spiritual senses. They, they thought that they would continue in sin forever. But it's all crashing down right before their eyes here in the final days. Eleven, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore cargoes of gold silver precious stones and pearls fine linen purple silk and scarlet cloth every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind excuse me articles of every kind made of ivory costly wood bronze iron and marble cargoes of cinnamon and spice and incense myrrh and frankincense of wine and olive oil of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and bodies and souls of men. And so we see from these verses that the collapse of the world system in the final days means the world economy collapses as well. And consequently, the unsaved are left with absolutely nothing because that's their life. And when a person lives for the things of this world rather than living for God, when they live for the next toy or the next football season or the next party or the next vacation and here's the important thing they exclude God from their life they're eventually going to be left with nothing 14 they will say the fruit you long for is gone from you all your riches and splendor have vanished never to be recovered and so all the things that people put before God will one day be gone forever. All their idols will disappear. Do you know that those who reject Jesus Christ as God and Lord and Savior in favor of something else, some other idol, will outlive that something else? How do you like that? They're going to outlive their God, so-called. It's true. They're going to outlive and outlast their idol. And believe me, a dead idol, a dead God can't save them from hell. See, the real God won't save them because they rejected Christ and their dead idol can't save them, so they're hell bound with nobody to help them. 15. 
the merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off terrified at her torment they will weep and mourn and cry out woe woe O great city dressed in fine linen purple and scarlet and glittering with gold precious stones and pearls in one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin and the impenitent sinners still don't get it they mourn over the loss of the economy they mourn over the loss of the world system but they do not mourn over their sin they don't get it they don't care about what their sin has done to God they don't care about that they only care about themselves and their buying power so instead of being sorry for their sins they feel sorry for themselves they have nothing left absolutely nothing and yet they still refuse to repent and receive Christ they just don't get it last part of verse 17 every sea captain and all who travel by ship the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off when they see the smoke of her burning they will exclaim was there ever a city like this great city they will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out woe woe O great city where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth in one hour she has been brought to ruin and again all the people mourn not over their sin but over their loss and of course all their crying won't change a thing they could have avoided all this sadness if they had only repented and received Christ but now it's too late the end is here 20 rejoice over her O heaven rejoice saints and apostles and prophets God has judged her for the way she treated you all Christians from every age who had patiently endured mistreatment because of their faithfulness to Jesus are told to rejoice God said his people would be winners and those who oppose Christ would be losers and that's what we see here in this chapter all the righteous from every age whoever asks this question why do the wicked prosper well they will have their answer in the final days the answer is the wicked do not prosper Christ rejecting sinners do not have it good in the end this world will come crashing down and along with it anything they ever enjoyed